Welcome back. This is theCUBE, day three of the Software AG International User Groups Conference. I'm Paul Gillen. Uh, it's a good thing we have unidirectional mics here because it is bedlam behind me. You can't, you can't hear it, but there are lots and lots of people here for a coffee break. A uh, very excited group at this conference. And uh, one of the exciting presentations we heard was yesterday was from Ian Batty, who's the head of the Office of Architecture at St. James Place and who agreed to join us today. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you for asking me to talk with you. So, uh, good, good to be here. Uh, I, we've attended this conference uh, for a couple of years now. And uh, as you say, there's a buzz about the place that's, that's interesting to, to see. It really uh, is. Uh, and you were uh, talking yesterday about a topic that's a little bit unusual for a tech conference about change management, about man how, how organization change is managed. Let's first hear a little bit about St. James Place. I'm not sure everyone is familiar with your company. Yeah, I, I, uh, yes, that, I think that, that's fair enough. Uh, I, I may know a lot about it, but it's a company that's not, not globally known. St. James's Place uh, is a financial services company. We provide uh, financial advice to primarily individuals, um, and we then we provide that advice to them as where they need to save for their pensions and, and, and uh, other investments that they may wish to have. Um, and then we manage that money on their behalf. So they will invest in funds that Finance St. James's Place constructs and manages for you. So that uh, I, I believe the tagline is, is that invest in the future that you want to have or something like that. So it's, it's a long term financial investment plan with a number of independent businesses operating as financial advisors um, that are then used by St. James's Place to manage those investments. Um, and I work in the, the Office of Architecture, which uh, you mentioned I, I, we work in business change. I, I work in business change. I don't work in IT, which is the first thing that people sometimes find unusual as an architect not working in IT. And I think that is one of the, the critical things that that we do slightly differently from a number of organizations is that we are very concerned with, with changing the business in the whole. It doesn't have to be upgrading servers, it doesn't have to be deploying new software, releasing functionality. It's how do we change the business as its entirety? And that, that classically covers the four dimensions of, of architecture, of technology, application, data, and people. Um, on the business side. Where we are focusing much more, where we are seeing the value that is, and this is a change in enterprise architecture generally, but our focus specifically is to, to focus much, much more into the business space. But that is where the value is. That is where companies have traditionally not been able to, to communicate well why something is happening. And, and it's one of the key things that we, we try to do is, is understand that, that why. And whether that's a why in terms of people being changing their roles, people being reassigned, project reassigned, new software, whatever else it will be, why are we doing this? That, that senior executives will make strategic announcements, that's what we're doing, and people's lives will change as they get a new job or their, their, their role changes. Um, and it's, it's, it's easy to disempower your employees in that way and to make them feel like they're, they're just part of a, a machine and, and a cog. It, and it sounds counterintuitive. I mean, I think it, you would naturally, as a, as a top executive, want to explain why changes are being made. Why do you think that doesn't happen? I, I think that there's a gap. I, I genuinely believe, having spoken with, with a, a large number of executives over my, my, my career in, in a number of organizations, not just St. James's Place, is that because the, a, a C-suite organization, people working in, in that very top echelon, they have access to additional information, they have knowledge that they are bringing into that position, and they genuinely believe that the deliverables that they are providing to their workforce are sufficient. And I think the gap that we are identifying is, is uh, in the old scientific technology, what has been provided by the C-suite is necessary, but not sufficient. It is not providing that translation from a high level direction of where we're going, what we need to do, how we're going into, into a traceable 
deliverable stream of work that oftentimes we find there's a deliverable stream of work and there's the high level objective. And that gap in the middle is where enterprise architecture is now starting to play its most important role, in my opinion. So describe how you go about that process. I mean, how do you, how do you communicate effectively and thoroughly to the people who need to, to hear the message? And how do you know when you've done it right? <laughs> I'm not going to say we have all the answers on that one. I think that's that's the first thing to say is that how do you communicate with with the uh, with the executives? We have to communicate in a way that they understand the additional value that will occur as a result of talking to somebody else. That that's the key thing is that you have people who are time short uh, and information loaded already and and. And, and explaining to them, because senior executives are not dumb people. They're very, very intelligent people. You know, men, women who have got to those positions through years of work and practice, and they know how to make decisions. What we are looking at doing is, is closing, I, I call it, the, the, it, it how, to, how to influence someone is closing the gap between information and emotion. Is that a lot of those decisions that are being taken by executives are based on a certain amount of information and then emotion beyond that. And actually there have been various studies that have been made where it doesn't matter how much more information you provide to people, they will continue to make that decision based upon an emotional basis. Um, and and that, as I say, it genuinely been proved with, with psychologists making medical decisions based on, on case studies. Um, that that's what's going to happen. So what we have to do is work out how do we close that gap and influence people? Because providing more information top down or bottom up isn't going to make that difference. It's what do we need to do? How do we need to engage? How do we need to communicate? to make that influence work better, to close that gap between that emotional response and the information you can provide. So it sounds like empathy has become an important Absolutely. Uh, attribute. Of, of Emotional intelligence and empathy and understanding and the realization that more and more people are, are I, I believe rightfully so, questioning their place in society, in an organization. They are questioning the value of, of the work that they are doing. They want to be part of something. Daniel Pink's idea of mastery, autonomy, and purpose, that I need to know why I'm doing this. What is the purpose of doing this? For some organizations, if you're saving lives, working in the health service, or, um, or providing clean water to someone's home, taking it away. It's there's obvious. A, there's, it's obvious. Yeah. When you're looking at something like a financial services company that I work in, it's a harder sell for someone to say, all I do is, write code for a spread uh, to, to make a spreadsheet or an application to do things it's easy for those employees to get disenfranchised it's easy for them to feel that they're being dictated to by senior management or technology trends are coming in and they're not being listened to or any other reason that we lose employees engagement um, well let's, let's take a real world example now that I think a lot of people watching this are wrestling with, and that is AI. They're bringing AI into organizations. There's a lot of concern, uh, fear even, in the workforce about AI replacing jobs. We're telling them, no, 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 that's not going to happen. It's going to, AI will be your co-pilot, not your, not your replacement, but that fear still exists. What advice do you have for communicating to these top executives as they begin to introduce AI? AI is, is a hot topic, absolutely. We're seeing it throughout presentations here. Everyone's talking about this over the last few days, how they're going to talk about with AI. Um, AI is an interesting one because it's a little bit like, I, I'm a data architect by historical preference or, or pro profession. Big data was a technology that came in. AI is a technology that's come in. It's a new technology that in many situations is looking for a problem to solve. And because it's looking for a problem to solve, people are trying to use it in many situations. 
many of which are not actually going to be effective. And I think this is where people are seeing the concern is that people are saying, we could use AI for this. And actually, as, as, we, as I've been learning in the last few days, I'm, my knowledge of AI is increasing daily with, with attending these kinds of conferences. AI is not necessarily a repeatable process. If you ask the same question of the same AI engine one day after another, you will get different answers. And that's resulting in fear in people when you need a consistent answer. And if you use that AI in one of those areas where you need that consistency of answer, then people are rightly afraid that technology is being forced upon them without genuinely understanding the intricacies of the role they do, the industry they work in, and the outcomes they need to achieve. There are other situations where you're doing a repeatable process, or there is genuinely knowledge out there that you don't want to start hitting Google and trying to write the scrap, scrap the piece of paper. I used to work in the oil business, uh, and I worked for a, a, a large oil company that had a little A5 pad of paper. I've, I've kept some of these sheets of paper. It was a blank sheet of paper, but down in the bottom right-hand corner, it said, still the most difficult environment to work in. Now, this is from an oil company that works offshore, in the Arctic, in the jungle, in frozen places. From them, the most difficult place to work in is a blank sheet of paper. How can we get AI to fill in that blank sheet of paper with something? that we then use that human's knowledge to refine. And this is the path that we're on with our AI, is making sure that we are using people's knowledge, and I'm using knowledge specifically, it's stuff that the computer cannot know about, stuff that you are bringing from a related discipline or from your experience of work or your, your knowledge. How can we use that to recognize where it's wrong, where it's not coming up with innovation, where it's not coming up with um, the, the right answer to your particular problem. And I think innovation is one of those key things that, that's already been identified repeatedly with AI. AI, almost by definition, can only look back at historically what has happened. Mm -hmm. For genuinely new ideas, that requires a carbon-based computer, right. not a silicon-based computer right. to we come up with it. We haven't figured that part out. We haven't figured Let's bring this uh, back to technology because this is a technology yeah. conference. You were giving your talk on the alphabet track, which is alphabet is for IT asset management. Uh, what role does software play in the change management practices you're talking about? Okay, so so actually, so alphabet supports two distinct areas of, of, of usage, which is the yeah, enterprise architecture tool and the strategic portfolio management. And I'm particularly focusing on strategic portfolio management. Um, and that means identifying where to spend your money, how much money you've got, what are the priorities you've got as a company. What we find that Alphabet brings for us is it has the ability for us to capture those high level corporate strategic goals. We can then break those down into more manageable chunks that will operate at divisional and then even team level. We identify the, the outcomes that we need to achieve for that. And we're already starting to create a large set of information. And it's critically, it's an interrelated set of information that needs to be presented ideally graphically so that people can assimilate that because there's a lot of information we're talking about. We then need to identify for those outcomes we're trying to achieve, what business capabilities, what applications, what servers, what groups of people, what information are we going to have an impact on? Oh, no. Suddenly you've gone from having you know, a vision, half a dozen corporate goals, 30 or 40 outcomes, 500 applications, making the links between those 30 or 40 outcomes, 500 applications, however many divisional units you've got in your company, however many information concepts you've got so that when you start to go into that business change process, you aren't starting from the blank sheet of paper. Okay, I've got this project that I'm going to deliver. Right, everyone, let's stand around the whiteboard. We'll brainstorm the applications that we think are going to be impacted by this. We'll, who are the people going to be impacted? The tool is providing us with a little bit like AI because I never believe any information that I've got is 100% accurate. Certainly not if I recorded it yesterday. Uh -huh. Um, it will always change, but I'm giving you 80, 90, occasionally 99% of the starting point 
of what you need to know so that when you go into your business change with an allocated budget, we know how much you've needed on that because we know the scope. Yeah. Now, there will always be things that come up. Every project runs into challenges, however many percentage of them run over time and over budget with additional complexities. We accept that, but we know the outcomes you're trying to achieve. We know the scope of the information and the applications that you're impacting. And that gives you a much tighter defined window of error and error bars on <clears throat> the length of time it'll take, the amount of stuff you do, because we have identified all the possible impacts for it. So that's what we're using the technology for. It's a journey to get the integration between what we do in Alphabet with all the other tools that are out there and all the other people, <coughs> me, and the cultural aspect of some people like starting with a whiteboard. <laughs> they like those ideas. Again, this comes back to how do we make it worthwhile for people? You can't just dictate from on high or from a different group. You've got to make it easier for someone to use the information from the tool than not. That's where you deliver the value to your organization. Thought-provoking stuff. Ian Batty, uh, very different message from what we usually hear at technology conferences, <laughs> but one that's every bit as, as relevant as, as anything we've, uh, we've heard about technology. Thank okay. you for joining us here. Thank you very much. We'll be back from Dublin at the Software AG International User Group Conference. I'm Paul Gill. Stay with us.